Well, I spent a good part of this past summer traveling to exotic places like Milwaukee and Indianapolis and Kansas City, uh, all to watch uh, my youngest son play basketball with what's called his AAU team. Now, that's kind of a term you may not recognize. It's a high-level travel basketball. If you're not familiar with that world, let me tell you a little bit about it. When you go to these tournaments in these cities, there are like 250 youth teams at once clustered around one high school or high school complex, and it's like a world inhabited by a different race of people, uh, people that come from a planet called Taltron, something like that. You see these 15-year-olds that are six foot nine inches tall with a dad that's 6'10 and a mom that's 6'4, just big, hulking families walking around. It's just really interesting to see because it's basketball and it's inhabited by tall people. And these tournaments are also attended by hundreds of college basketball coaches, not surprisingly. And they're looking for talent. And each one of these coaches is in what I would call the predicting business. Uh, they watch 15, 16 year old athletes and they try to predict what they're going to look like when they're 20, 21, 22. It's not unusual to have uh, major colleges like. Kentucky or Duke offer full scholarships to 15-year-old young men who have never played a single game of varsity high school basketball because they're, predict, they're pre, uh, predicting, they're projecting. And coaches that project or predict well um, become champions. And coaches that don't eventually get fired. And that's just the way the business goes. So if we roll back the tape a bit, uh, and let's assume that when legendary college coach Dean Smith saw a 16-year-old player named Mike Jordan when he was a junior in high school in Wilmington, North Carolina, that he saw enough raw talent to offer a full basketball scholarship to the University of North Carolina. Even though Coach Smith did not know exactly how great Jordan would become, uh, that made sense because he could see enough of the raw talent to predict at least some success. But imagine a different scenario. Imagine that Dean Smith had lived, let's say, in the 13th century in medieval Europe. Uh, seven centuries before Michael Jordan was born, seven centuries before the game of basketball was even invented. And let's say then he wrote in his journal and accurately predicted not only the arrival of a surpassing athletic talent, but predicted his birthplace, which was New York City, predicted where he would play college ball, predicted where this player, how many world championships he would win, which was six. And not only all that, also predicted at the height of his career, he would take a year off to try to play professional baseball, another sport that had not yet been invented. Now, if a man predicted all that in the 13th century, we would be impressed. And we'd probably read other things that guy had to say. Isn't that true? Well, that's kind of what Old Testament prophecy is like when we understand it. We are in a year-long preaching series called The Story of Jesus. And we're taking 52 weeks all this year to tell this great story. And by the way, let me give you one, little more, one more promo for the all-time bestseller book club. Um, the books came in this year. They look like this. It's a condensed version of the New Testament, the Gospels, told without chapter breaks or anything. It's just one continuous story without any repeat stories. If you've never read the Bible through or the New Testament, the story of Jesus, this is a great way to read it. If you participated last time in the book club, this is a different reading plan. It's shorter. It's more condensed. It's 10 weeks. It's four Gospels. It's one story. So get yourself signed up, and you can pick up your book when you sign up. Um, we'd love to have you involved in that. But the story of Jesus, we're starting with a little mini-series. This is the third week of a series called Anticipation, the Prophecies of the Messiah. Because properly understood, the entire Old Testament, the first two-thirds of your Bible, is really all about anticipation. We anticipate all kinds of things in our lives, don't we? Anticipation is a word that means hope, something good coming just around the corner. We might anticipate it, a long-awaited vacation. We might anticipate a graduation or a wedding. We might anticipate a World Series someday in our city. We might anticipate uh, the birth of a child. Perhaps nothing in human life is more anticipated than the birth of a child or a grandchild. My wife and I spent uh, a few days a couple of weeks ago visiting my parents in Ohio on the occasion of their 60th wedding anniversary. Uh, my nephew, my brother's son, Jeremy, and his wife are expecting their first child any time now within the next two weeks, and they are just bursting with anticipation. And it reminded me of that time in their own lives a couple of decades ago. Two weeks ago, we saw that the prophet Jeremiah wrote of anticipation, a coming king who would be the righteous branch of David. You might remember that phrase. And he called this 
king, Jehovah Sidkenu, this beautiful Hebrew name that was translated, the Lord is our righteousness. Saying a king will come one day who will not only be righteous in himself, but who will be able to make righteous the unrighteousness of this world. And today we look at a different prophetic voice that talks about what, what is called the suffering servant. We're looking at the great prophet Isaiah. I read these verses a moment ago for you as we took communion together. Let me read them again, Isaiah chapter 53. You can look in your Bible or look on the screens as I read. Well-known passage, you'll recognize many of these words. He, the coming king, was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. I'm going to pause there. Isaiah some 700 years before Jesus' birth, is saying that one is coming, a king is coming, who will suffer our rejection. He will suffer our rejection. As a pastor, I've done lots of weddings, and so I've heard lots and lots of stories about how couples met, how they fell in love, and I've then done their weddings. And all the stories are boy meets girl, boy chases girl, boy, you know, you hear all the stories. And I love hearing those stories. But about 10 years ago, I started hearing a little different kind of story. And at first it struck me as just kind of odd, and then it became more normal. Now, maybe three out of the five stories I might hear are like this. And these are online dating stories. People who, not, who meet not in the traditional way, at school or at work or through church or through a mutual friend who sets them up, but people who meet online. And if you've never looked out there to see what's out there, there are all kinds of dating websites you can visit. Here's a couple of them I found, and you might re- uh, recognize these. There's Match.com. Uh, there's one called eHarmony, which is actually started by a Christian counselor. You may have seen commercials on TV. There's one called Christian Mingle, and that's one of my favorites. I like to call it Christian Tingle. That's a whole different thing. Uh, there's even a website called FarmersOnly.com. I'm not making that up. It's true. It really is a site, but I can't help it. It just makes me smile. I can imagine how the conversation goes. You know, you're on the computer. Do you like corn? I do too. Do you like tractors? What kind? John Deere? Yes. You know, it's just, it's just funny to me, and maybe that's how it goes. And if you grew up on a farm, I don't mean to be offensive. It just makes me smile. I've heard some really sweet stories about people who met in this manner. And, and when I was back in my single days, if I'd had one of the, I'd have been all over that because I found it hard to meet people. I was shy. Uh, and I've heard some really sweet stories. I also heard some kind of nightmarish stories. And some of those nightmarish stories have to do with people who, who pretend to be someone they're not on these sites. And even will post photos that really aren't them. And frankly, a lot of times it's guys who will post a slightly more attractive or younger or more hair or whatever picture and try to get a date that way. And I I think about that, and that's really not very smart, is it? Because the whole point of the dating website is they actually eventually meet someone face-to-face. And when you meet them face-to-face, you've posted a picture that's not you, how's that going to go? Not so well, right? When she shows up looking for Mr. Right and sees the face of Mr. Well, wrong, you're going to face probably rejection. And those are some of the nightmarish stories. The, part, the problem is that when we have an expectation of something, those expectations can lead us to be disappointed or disillusioned. And we see that in the prophets, I think. I said earlier that the Old Testament is about anticipation. It's about expectation. Uh, Many of the Old Testament passages tell us the people of Israel were waiting for the promises of God to be fulfilled through a person that they called the Anointed One or the Messiah. Uh, And what did the ancient Jewish people anticipate? What did they expect that Messiah to be like? I think the Bible tells us at least three major expectations the Jewish people had. First, they expected that the Messiah would be a king like King David was a king. 
In Jeremiah 23, where we started a couple of weeks ago, we read, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch that is a shoot off of the tree of David, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. So they were looking for a king, a king kind of like David. He would look like a king. He would carry himself like a king. He'd walk like a king. He would talk like a king. Messiah, anointed one, the king. Secondly, I think they looked for one who would be a warrior, also like King David. In 1 Samuel 18, which was written right after young David killed Goliath in battle. Everybody remembers that story. Five smooth stones, slingshot, and all that. We read this in 1 Samuel 18. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated Saul, the previous king, has struck down his thousands, David his ten thousands. In other words, they expected Messiah to be a mighty warrior like David and to be pretty good with the sword. It was an expectation anticipation. Thirdly, I think they looked at the Messiah would be a deliverer like Moses. Just as Moses delivered the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, so also Messiah would come to deliver his people from their enemies. And in Jesus' day, that would have meant the power of Rome. But what did they get instead? Back to Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. He was despised and rejected. Why? Because he was not what was expected. He did not come with a political agenda. We know even his closest followers among his disciples struggled with these expectations. James and John asked at one point to sit at Jesus' right hand and his left hand when he came into his glory. They were thinking glory like King David. He'll have a real throne. We'll be in on the kingdom. He had to explain to them, I'm not that kind of king. They were expecting a king like David. He didn't come preaching military overthrow of Rome. He came preaching something called the kingdom of God. We're going to learn about this later this year. He came preaching, turn the other cheek. Pray for, love your enemies. My brother right now, who's a pastor in Ohio, uh, is doing a sermon series right now called uh, get, get, Getting to Know the Real Jesus. And the subtitle is, I Thought You'd Be Taller. I love that. It's, you might want to go listen to sermons. It's Christ Community Chapel in Ohio. I thought you'd be taller. He's talking about expectations. We even carry expectations. But when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, the people shouted what? Hosanna! Hosanna to the King! To the Son of David! Why? They heard He had done miracles. They thought He was coming to deliver them from Rome. So they were willing to praise Him. And so when He allowed Himself to be arrested tried as a common criminal, put to death on a Roman cross, they did what? They rejected him. He wasn't the king they expected. So he could not possibly be Messiah. He was rejected because he was not a man of power and triumph, but a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then we see this phrase, as one from whom men hide their faces. It's a brutal sentence. What causes us to hide our faces? What causes us to avert our eyes? Isn't it true that we hide our faces from that which repulses us? From that which we, that, from that which we find offensive or disgusting, ugly, or hideous? You know, it's true that many people still hide their faces from Jesus today in lots of different ways. Everyone has an opinion about Jesus. Almost everyone in our culture would have an opinion about Jesus if you ask them. And the problem with people uh, having opinions about Jesus is most of them will just create their own opinion about Jesus and they'll leave the Bible out of it. They'll just create their own opinion. They'll have their own version of Jesus that they think is true. The problem with that is that that version of Jesus will hardly ever confront you about anything. That Jesus will never make a demand of you or your life. And that Jesus really can never save you because you've created him yourself. He's rejected today when people 
see him as just as another great teacher on the Mount Rushmore of spiritual figures of history. That's how most people see him. But when they've done that, they've rejected him because that's not what he came to be. Or when he's used, when his name, which the Bible says is the name above every name, it's the name before whom every knee will bow someday, when that name is used as nothing more than a curse word or an exclamation point or an epithet, he's rejected and despised. He still suffers our rejection today in many ways. The prophet tells us that the one who is coming will not only suffer rejection, he will also die for our salvation. He will die for our salvation. It's the prediction of the prophet. Last week, Jeff mentioned a man named Ed Catmull. I also talked about him a couple weeks ago. The company that produces uh, animated films like Toy Story and Bugs Life and so forth. And when he was interviewed recently um, by Bill Hybels at the Global Leadership Summit, if you were here at our West Campus, you saw that, uh, he said, I make movies because I believe stories can change the world. I make movies because I believe stories can change the world. The world. Now, Ed Catmull's not a Christian that I know of, but I think he's on to something because I think stories do change the world, but there's only one story that truly changes the world. But stories are powerful. Think for a moment about the stories that we love, the movies that we love, the movies that we watch over and over again. Think how many of them have the theme of sacrificial love running through them. For example, I thought of just a few off the top of my head, like Lion King, one of our family favorites. Lion King's the story about Mufasa, who is king of the jungle, who gave himself to save his young son Simba from a uh, stampeding herd of wildebeest. Sacrificial love. Or think of a movie like Saving Private Ryan, Steven Spielberg's epic uh, movie, war movie, about uh, the story of saving a private named Ryan who had three brothers die already in battle and they wanted to save his family from further grief, so they sent Captain John Miller, played by Tom Hanks, to go get this young man from the battlefield and bring him home safely. And Hanks' character ends up giving his life to save Private Ryan. Sacrificial theme. Even a rather vulgar, secular film like Gran Torino, directed by Clint Eastwood, tells the story of a hardened and cynical alcoholic veteran of the Korean War who eventually gives his life for some immigrants that he at one point hates. And when he dies, if you've seen the movie, and it's a hard movie to watch, I I, I don't even know if I recommend it, he dies, arms outstretched, clearly in the shape of a crucifix, of the crucifixion, to communicate sacrificial love. Now, sacrificial love touches us, a a a chord very deep in us, because that's the story that changes the world. Isaiah 53 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Isaiah is predicting 700 years before his birth that one would come who would be pierced for our transgressions and that by his wounds we would be healed. The question is why? Why would Messiah, the anointed one, the king, have to suffer? Well, first, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Hebrews 9.22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified by blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Remember, the Old Testament is about anticipation. And throughout the Old Testament, sin is addressed through the sacrificial system, through the shedding of an animal's blood to cover the sins of the people. God wanted his people to know that sin destroys. Sin is serious business. Sin requires a serious response. He wanted his people to know that forgiveness is costly. Then the New Testament tells us the final sacrifice for sin is Jesus, the Lamb of God. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, the Lamb without blemish or defect. Secondly, God chose to heal the brokenness of the world through his own brokenness. Isaiah says he was pierced, he was crushed. Upon him was our chastisement. Why? Well, because this is love. You know you are loved when someone sacrifices for you. 
we know love in this way. Third, he chose to conquer death by dying himself. Hebrews 2.14 says, Since the children, that's us, have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity. Next week we start a new mini-series called Preparation, looking at the humanity of the early life of Christ. So that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all of their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. There's so much in this passage. Let me summarize it with a story I heard my brother tell just recently in a sermon. My brother and his wife have supported a young missionary couple uh, who are serving in, uh, in a very remote region of Southeast Asia. They're serving um, a people called the Kora people, a people group that's very small. They have no written language. So they've spent six years uh, getting to know this community of people and getting to know their language, even though it's not written down anywhere. They've learned their language. And over those six years, they've prepared uh, 50 stories that retell the story of God. That's what they're calling them, the story of God. These people have no, no concept of the Bible, no concept of, of who God is and all that. So they start with creation, and they're moving all the way through, and then they get to the stories about Jesus in the New Testament, his life, death, resurrection. And they're working with a young man who was about 14 when they met him, who could speak both languages, English and this tribal language, and now he's 20. And after they had a number of these stories put together, where they'd moved all the way from creation through the Old Testament, when they got to the story of Jesus, they introduced this character, Jesus, and early on in that process, without knowing the end of the story, this young man said, I, I need to know what happens to Jesus. And they said, well, you're going to have to wait till we get those stories written. He said, no, I, I need to know what happens to him. They said, well, why, why do you want to know now? He goes, because I think he has to die. They said, well, how do you know this? He said, well, in the Old Testament, all those stories are about how our sin separates us from God and has to be covered with the blood of animals. This Jesus is greater than the animals. So his blood must not only cover our sins, but his blood must wipe out and forgive our sins. Am I right? Does he have to die? He saw the story coming, the story that changes the world. Imagine his excitement when he gets all the way to the end of the story and he finds out that the story does not end with death at all. Because the third thing the prophet tells us here is the one who is coming will not only die for our salvation but rise for our justification. Now, those of you who know me at all over the years um, know that one of my favorite movies of all time is The Princess Bride. I think the whole world divides itself into categories of people. You know, White Sox fans, Cubs fans, introverts, extroverts, and people who get Princess Bride and people who don't. You know, how many of you have seen that movie? How many are Princess Bride fans are? Okay, so you guys will know. If you don't get the movie, bear with me for just for a couple of, couple of minutes. One of the great lines in that movie, and it's a goofy movie, is delivered by a character named Miracle Max, who's played by the comedian Billy Crystal. The hero of the story is a guy named Wesley who appears to have been tortured to death by agents of the evil king Humperdinck, and his friends take him to Miracle Max looking for a miracle, right? That's what Miracle Max does. M Max takes one look at Wesley's lifeless body laying on his table and says, I've seen worse, he says, which is funny in and of itself. And then he says this, there's a big difference between mostly dead and all the way dead. I love that line. There's a big difference between mostly dead and all the way dead. See, the world is full of near-death experiences. It seems like every couple of months there's a book or a movie about a near-death experience, you know, light at the end of the tunnel, warmth, all that sort of stuff, right? I don't pay any attention to those folks. I just don't. And, and I don't think you really should either for one main reason, mostly dead. Big difference between mostly dead and all the way dead. In all of human history, there's only one story. Actually, there's two, but they all revolve around one person who was all the way dead and came back to all the way alive. Only one story. We're going to look at that story in a few months, but look at right, right now what the prophet Isaiah said 700 years before this person was born. Isaiah 53. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. 
there's an anticipation of resurrection life. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life, there's another hint, and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, yet a third hint of resurrection life coming. And he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he has poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. All these are hints as to what is to come. And again, in Psalm 16, we read in the Old Testament, Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. The Old Testament is anticipation. It tells us that death is the final enemy because death is the signature of Satan himself, the great enemy of God. But death is not the end. That's what we see here. Death will not be the end. The story does not end with death. The story ends with life. And Jesus' resurrection life seals our justification. Look at what it says in Romans chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writing. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Now, justification is a kind of a fancy theological churchy sounding word. It just means being set right, being made righteous in the eyes of God. Remember, the whole world has a righteousness problem. If you open the paper today, like I do every morning, you see that the world has a righteousness problem. You see stories of racial unrest. You see stories of terrorism. You see stories of domestic violence, human trafficking, over and over again. The story doesn't change. The world we live in is not a righteous place, and we are not righteous people if we look down deeply into ourselves with any kind of honesty at all. The whole story that we're studying this year, from front to back, is the story of how the righteousness problem of the world gets set right. That's the story. The whole story is anticipating one who is coming, who is able and willing to make righteous that which is unrighteous. The whole story of the Bible is not about religion. It's a misunderstanding. It's not about religion. The story of the Bible is not about becoming a little, a little better person. It's not about moral improvement. The whole story of the Bible is about death and resurrection. Death and resurrection. A couple of weeks ago, I hope you were there, we celebrated our annual FBCG All Church picnic right here at the West Campus on a Sunday afternoon. A lot of food, a lot of fun, music and so forth. Um, and we wrapped up the whole event with baptism as we always do. Right up there on the lawn, we put our tank out there, and we baptized. I really hope you were there. If you weren't there this year, make a point to be there next year. There's, there's almost nothing more encouraging than hearing 12 stories, all wildly different. I mean wildly different, and yet all the same. Stories of transformation, stories of forgiveness, stories of grace, stories of death and resurrection, spiritually speaking. Stories of new life. And each time we baptized, and this is a picture of Daniel, who was 32 years old, been in this church his whole life. Couldn't articulate his faith real clearly due to personal issues, but he could say, yes, I know Jesus loves me. I say, buried with Christ in baptism, risen with him in newness of life. The story is death and resurrection. Risen the new life now, a life of hope, forgiveness, peace, joy, but risen also anticipation, in anticipation of new life then, eternal life to come. All of this anticipated 2,700 years ago by a prophet named Isaiah who told us about the suffering servant who would come. And this year, we're telling his story. Hope you'll stay with us every week of this whole series. Don't miss a single installment. Let's bow in prayer. Lord, I thank you today for the power of your word. I thank you for the promise of the one called the suffering servant. Isaiah was looking ahead. We are looking back at the arrival of this one who came. We thank you for the one who came to make right again. We thank you for the power of your promise, for the anticipation of of new life, new life now and new life to come. Take us through your story and encourage our hearts by it. In your name I pray, amen.